Spirit, one God. Amen. We thank our Lord uh, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, for another Bible preach session this very Sunday. Uh, we thank Him for His infinite mercy to bring us together again uh, to share His Word, which is the truth, the life-giving uh, Word of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For those who are watching us live, I pray that you are always in good health and in good spirit. And before we start our session, if I could ask everyone to stand for the Lord's Prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgave our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Psalm number 30. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have lifted me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried out to you, and you healed me. O Lord, you brought my soul up from the grave. You have kept me alive, that I should not go down to the pit. Sing praise to the Lord, you saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, his favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Now, in my prosperity, I said, I shall never be moved. Lord, by your favor, you have made my mountain stand strong. You hid your face, and I was troubled. I cried out to you, O Lord, and to the Lord, I made supplication. What profit is there in my blood when I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it declare your truth? Hear, O Lord, and have mercy on me. Lord, be my helper. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have put off my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness. To the end that my glory may sing praise to you and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Amen. Please be seated. Well, once again, we thank our Lord Jesus Christ for another Bible preach. I pray all of us are doing well and um, enjoying life as it comes and leaving everything in the Lord's capable hands. Before we start our session or this Bible preach, I'd like to ask our son in Christ, Eddie Abraham, to begin this evening with this wonderful hymn, Eddie. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing or to a good Assyrian uh, red rice meal um, or dolma. Uh, normally it's marmari, please, I need help. But regardless, that's what love is all about and we need to sacrifice and tolerate one another. So happy Valentine's Day, guys, and enjoy it and buy those teddy bears and those roses and those cylinders. But I just hope uh, this is not, uh, this is not, is the only way to reflect that love. We should really be there for one another indeed, not just in buying presents to one another, but also it is one of the ways to express our love toward one another by remembering each, each other with gifts and presents and Chanel and Versace and the big teddy bear with the big heart saying, I love you. So there you go. Now, coming to our topic, Luke 11, verses 5 to 13. We are going to give it this title, Lend Me Three Loaves of Bread. And this session is a continuation of a session over a year ago. Lend Me Three Loaves of Bread. 
The Lord Jesus, in this, in this passage, he's talking about three things. We are actually coming across um, Where is my paper? Here we go. We are talking about three uh, trilogies. What is trilogy? Three things. We are talking about three trilogies. So three, three things. The number one is the first trilogy is about lend me three loaves of bread. This guy goes to his neighbor at midnight knocks at the neighbor's door and says neighbor I've just received a visitor from a far away place and it's midnight I have nothing to offer to my visitor please neighbor can you lend me three loaves of bread that's the first trilogy the second trilogy the Lord Jesus follows this parable of lend me the three loaves of bread the Lord comes with another trilogy ask and it will be given to you seek and you will find knock and it will be opened to you another trilogy ask seek and knock and then the Lord Jesus follows it with another trilogy and that trilogy is number one if a son asks for bread from any father among you Will, you, will he give him a stone? If you ask as a son, if you ask your dad for a bread, will your dad give you a stone instead? Two, if, you, if a son asks his dad for a fish, will dad give him a serpent instead? And if a son asks his dad for an egg, will his dad give him a scorpion? Another trilogy. So the first trilogy, three loaves of bread. The second trilogy, ask, seek, knock. The third trilogy, if you ask for a bread, will your dad give you a stone? If you ask for a fish, will he give you a serpent? If you ask for an egg, will he give you a scorpion? Three trilogies which are connected to one another. And each, and the first one of each trilogy goes hand in hand. The second one in each trilogy goes hand in hand. And the third one in each trilogy goes hand in hand. And it's dealing with the human being that is made out of body, soul, and spirit. We are made out of body, soul, and spirit. And these three trilogies talking and dealing and um, approaching the three components that makes the human being body, soul, and spirit. I'll give you an example. The first loaf, lend me three loaves. The first loaf talks about the birth of the spirit. Therefore, um, the, 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 the first one in the first trilogy and the first one in the second trilogy and the first one in the third trilogy all deals with the spirit. So the first law of talks about the birth of the spirit and the second trilogy, ask. So ask is hand in hand, goes hand in hand with the first law of, which is dealing with the birth of the spirit. So to deal with the birth of the spirit, how do I get born spiritually again? Ask in the second trilogy. And in the third trilogy, um, and the third trilogy is, if you ask your dad for a bread, will he give you a stone? So bread, stone, ask, the first love, it is all together dealing with the spirit being born a second time. The second love talks about the salvation of the soul. Talks about the salvation of the soul. And the second point of the second trilogy the word is seek and you shall find so the second point in the first trilogy is the second love talks about the salvation of the soul it meets it the word seek in the second trilogy and in the third trilogy if you ask your dad for a fish will he give you a serpent so when you put the second love the salvation of the soul uh, it matches it 
the word seek in the second trilogy and it matches it ask for a fish will dad give you a serpent in the third trilogy all these three talks about the salvation of the soul in the third love talks about the redemption of the body talks about the redemption of the body and if you haven't noticed look how we are putting him it is the birth of the spirit salvation of the soul redemption of the body because this is the way the holy bible tells us about each component that makes up the human being the birth is only for the spirit the body cannot be born the soul cannot be born it is only the spirit is born again hmm. see how the holy bible talks all this is just an intro to what saint luke is saying so birth is to do with the spirit the soul can only be saved the body can only be redeemed so now the third one is the body the redemption of the body and the second trilogy what meets that third love is knock and it shall be opened unto you and in the third point of the third trilogy if you ask your dad for an egg will he give you a scorpion so the third um, love is the redemption of the body met by knock met by ask for an egg will you get a scorpion all this talks about the redemption of the body now let's come to the first session of this topic we're gonna discuss from verses 5 to 8 verses 5 to 8 it talks about this this guy goes to his neighbor and asks his neighbor for three loaves of bread now the Holy Bible interprets itself by itself where do we find in another place in the Holy Bible about loaves of bread or three loaves of bread when we when we go to first Samuel chapter 10 first Samuel chapter 10 Saul meets with Samuel along the way now Saul later on happened to be the first king of Israel the Lord God chose Samuel uh, chose uh, uh, Saul and he was anointed by Samuel to become the king over Israel now Saul came from a very rich family his dad was a looks like a merchant on a very high level so he had he was working for his dad helping his dad with his business like so many children help their parents with their family business so he had a couple of donkeys fully loaded with merchandise to take them and uh, you know for business for to help his dad along the way these donkeys run away and they are gone missing Saul cannot go back to his dad and say I lost all your merchandise I need to find these donkeys with the merchandise on him before I speak and face my daddy so he thought about it he said there is no way in the world I'm gonna find them humanly physically it's impossible what am I gonna do I've heard of this guy called Samuel God talks to him he happens to be like a prophet of God God reveals a lot of secrets to this man of God I'll go and ask in this neighborhood do you know where Samuel is because I'm gonna ask him to pray to God for God to reveal where the donkeys are to regain them again so he goes and Samuel is coming his way and they meet along the way and the moment Samuel sees Saul he pours a jar of a bottle of oil uh, holy oil on Saul and anoint Saul king over Israel it's amazing how God works in our life what we seek what we ask for it is totally different to what God has planned for us already I've gone to the man of God 
seeking my donkeys to be found, I end up being king over all of Israel. Man, <laughs> would you have ever dreamt of this? Saul, never. Actually, I remember a true story. I've mentioned it a while back. Arnold Palmer, to some of you maybe you don't recognize this name, but he was a very famous golf player. You know that golf, they hit that ball with a stick and chase the ball. <laughs> so Arnold Palmer, an Aussie by birth, but lived most of his life in America. But he's, Auss he's Aussie by birth. He was an extremely famous golf player of his time. One day, it's a true story. One day, the king of Saudi Arabia invited all the famous golf players from all over the world for the opening of a new golf course in the middle of the desert of Saudi Arabia. Now, the desert of Saudi Arabia, it is all sand. It is impossible for any green things to grow there. To make a golf course there, it was almost an impossible task. It took a huge effort to make it happen, but it was. So for the opening of this new golf course, he invited all the celebrities, the great famous golfers of the world. So they went to Saudi Arabia to be with the, with the king of Saudi Arabia. They played golf just for fun, opening ceremony. And then that evening, they were going to have dinner with the king himself. So Arnold Palmer is telling the story. So he said, I was there among great golf players of the world. And then the king comes and mingles between all of us. And he comes and greets every single one and talks to them face to face, individually, one on one. And then the king of Saudi Arabia came to me and he said, Arnold, thank you for making it. Please ask anything of me and I shall give it to you. He said, I was not expecting for the king of Saudi Arabia to put me on the spot. I was so embarrassed. What shall I ask for, king? Why did you put me on the spot like that? So he said, I thought for, for some quick seconds and I didn't know what to ask. I said, how about a club, king? He said, done. So Arnold goes back to America. And then one week goes by, two weeks goes, go by. He goes to his mailbox, checks to see if the king has sent him anything. Nothing. Three weeks, nothing. Arnold Palmer said, come on, man, wake up. The king is so busy. Do you think he's going to remember what he said to you? He's so busy with his affairs and, and that position that he, that he holds. He is totally forgotten about it. One day that Arnold had forgotten about what the, what the king promised him, he comes to check his mailbox and to his shocking surprise, there was a big envelope with a big red writing across it, confidential. And he looks at the address and it's from the king of Saudi Arabia. He runs inside the house, can't wait to open the envelope. He opens the envelope. He pulls out this letter. To his shock, it was a title deed to a 500 acres golf club. If you are not aware of the game of golf, the word club can mean two things. One, that piece of stick that you play with, that one stick is called a club, and a club can be referred to the entire property you play on. Now, when Arnold Palmer asked the king for a club, he meant the stick. The king translated it as a king. He meant the entire golf course. So he gave him a title deed to millions of dollars worth of land. You see, we ask God for things our way and God gives them his way. Now, and everyone talks about what they are capable of. You can only think of what you can achieve 
you cannot think and dream of things that are outside of your scope, outside of your capacity. Now, since God is the infinite King of Kings, so when He gives His, His might, His capability is infinite. So when I ask Him for a club, I speak my language, He speaks His language. My language, I can afford only a stick. God is the rich. God, all the wealth is under His jurisdiction. He will give you according to His capability. He will give you the whole golf course, not the club as a stick, but the club as the entire course. If an earthly king thinks much greater than me and you, how much more the heavenly king, the infinite God. So anyway, Saul is seeking the donkeys, ends up being the king of Israel. It's amazing. There you go. So next time, don't be surprised when God gives you something you've never anticipated. Because God works his way, not our way. Now, so Samuel meets Saul and anoints him straight away king over Israel. The Lord God reveals to Samuel, this is the future king. Now when he anoints Saul as king, he says to Saul, I want you to leave now and go to, to Rachel's tomb. Who is Rachel? The wife of our father Jacob. I want you to go to Rachel's tomb and at the tomb there you're going to find two men. These two men will tell you the donkeys are found and your father is worried about you saying, what shall I do about my son? So the father is not concerned about the donkeys. He is more concerned about the well-being of his son. But the donkeys are found. These two men at the tomb, they're going to say to you, the donkeys are found. Don't worry. It's all cool. How often do we lose it when we face a challenge? How often do we almost give up when we hit a dead end? When we say it's too late, the door is shut, the road has come to an end. All, ev everywhere I turn, there is no hope, there is no escape, there is no coming out of this. So what can I do? That's it. Might as well call it a day and throw that white flag and that cloth on that boxing ring and say, I'm not fighting anymore. No. God can change your impossible situation into a so easy thing before you even blink your eyes. Believe me, I know what I'm talking about. I didn't just read it, I lived it. And I'm still living it. And I pray I always live it. Jesus is amazing. Amazing. So go to Rachel's tomb. You'll find two men, they'll tell you the donkeys are found and dad is only concerned about your well-being son. And then he said, do I go back to my dad? Saul is saying, he said, no, no, no. From the tomb of Rachel, I want you to go to this place called Terebinth tree of Tabor. You're going to find three men this time going up to Bethel, Bethel, the house of God. You'll find three men going up to Bethel and they will meet you along the way as they are going to Bethel to the house of God. One of them, one of the three men is carrying three young goats. The other one, three loaves of bread. It's our topic. Lend me three loaves of bread. You find it in 1 Samuel chapter 10. The other man is carrying three loaves of bread. The other one is carrying a skin of wine and they will give you two loaves of bread. They will give you two loaves of bread. He said, okay, after that, can I go to my dad? He said, no, I want you to go to, to the hill of God where the Philistine border is. I want you to go to the hill of God where the Philistine border is or garrison or the border is. You will meet a group of prophets coming down from the high place. 
with stringed instrument, a tambourine, a flute, and a harp before them. And they will be prophesying. The Spirit of the Lord will come upon you, Saul, and you will prophesy with them, and you will turn into another man. You'll change. Saul meets Samuel. Samuel anoints him king over Israel. He says, can I go home now? He said, no, go to the tomb of Rachel. You'll meet two men. These two men will say the donkeys are found and your dad is concerned about your well-being. He said, can I go then home? He said, no, go and you'll meet three men going up to the house of God. And as you meet them, they, one of them is carrying three young goats, the other three loaves of bread, the other a skin of a skin of wine they'll give you two loaves of bread he said can I go home he said no go to the border of Palestine you're gonna meet prophets coming from the high hill they are praising God they are prophesying enter uh, amidst them be with them and praise God with them the Holy the Spirit of God will descend on you and you will prophesy as well and when you prophesy you will turn into another person another man you'll change now the first lesson three loaves of bread go to the tomb of Rachel the first stop or the first station going from here to Liverpool the first station by train the first station is the tomb of Rachel actually imagine if these stations are named this Station number one, you are now at Rachel's tomb. Those who want to get off, get off right now. So the first station is Rachel's tomb. Let's come to our father Jacob. Our father Jacob went to his uncle Laban, his mother's brother. Jacob's mother's brother, Laban. Laban had daughters. He said, uncle, I came, I want to marry one of your daughters. He said, which one? He said, I want Rachel, baby. Because Rachel is good looking. He said, Rachel is not cheap, bro. You got to work for it. Hmm? You got to go the hard yaka, the extra mile for Rachel. But before you think about marrying Rachel, how about Leah? She's a good girl. You don't want to take Leah? And he said, nah, I don't want Leah. He said, for free. He said, no, I want Rachel. So he looks like he was a stubborn man. Sometimes being too stubborn is not healthy. It gets you into a lot of trouble. He said, no, no, it's either Rachel or nothing. He said, well, since you insist, You'll have to work for me as a slave for seven years. You served me for seven years. And then I'll give you Rachel. He said, no worries. She's worth it, brother. So he works for seven years. And after seven years are done, he goes to his uncle Laban. And he said, I've served the seven years as, you, as we, we made a deal. Now where is Rachel? He said, she is not that easy, baby. You have to work another seven years if you want to see Rachel as a wife for you. He said, but you told me seven. He said, that's it, tough luck. It's another seven years or it's nothing. Jacob works another seven years. 14 years of hard work labor to get Rachel after 14 years finally he marries Rachel but along the way he marries Leah for free now the Holy Bible does not mention that Leah was ugly does not mention that Leah was deformed or anything of such the only thing that the Holy Bible says about Leah that she had weak eyesight. All she needed an optometrist with good glasses that said she was gorgeous, stunning, breathtaking, but she had a weak eyesight, that's all. He took her as a wife for free, didn't work for her. Rachel, 14 years. Man, talking of love, seriously. 
14 years of slavery. Aren't we all Jacob? We are. Rachel represents the world. Leah represents eternity. Where our sight is so weak to see eternity. All we see is the world. You talk about heaven, nobody moves. You talk about clubbing, everybody jumps. You talk about church, few go. You talk about downtown, everyone goes. You talk about praising and worship, number people go. You talk about M&M, wa'a wa'a, rap, everyone goes. To the world, we are so strong. We see everything so vivid. But when it comes to eternal matters, we've got a short sight. We have a weak eyesight to the eternal life. Leah is offered to us for free. We don't want her. But Rachel, we are working as slaves to get her. And at the end, she is not for us. You see, we work so hard to gain the world, but who's going to conquer the world? No one. We came empty-handed from the mother's womb. We will go back to Mother Earth empty-handed. We will take nothing. We came with nothing. We will leave with nothing. The world is not ours. We need to confess this, acknowledge it, and wake up and stop chasing the world. Because the world is going to do one thing for us, enslave us. We will become slaves to our own pleasures and lusts. Rachel. And the word Rachel in the Hebrew, Aramaic, Syriac language is Rahel or Rachel. Rachel or Rahel means, um, it means to um, like a tourist, someone that departs. Rahel is departure, is to depart. So Rahel, departure, it means departure. The word Rachel means to depart. We are all Rachel in this world because all of us one day, we will depart from this world and will take nothing with us. We are all departed souls. Look at Leah that was given for free to Jacob and he didn't want to take her. What did she give Jacob? She gave him four sons. Look at this. The first one, Reuben. Reuben or Ruel or Raobin. Reuben is the firstborn. It's the first son to be born. And the firstborn means represent blessings. Because if you are the firstborn, you get double the blessings. So Leah, the one who came for free, gave him Reuben, the blessings, the firstborn blessings. She gave him Simeon or Simon, the majority of the Bible writers, the scribes, came from the tribe of Simon or Simeon. The people who wrote the word of God are from the tribe of Simeon or Simon. She gave him Levi, priesthood came from Levi. She gave him Judah, Christ the Messiah came from the tribe of Judah. Wow. Look at Leah, what blessings she's given Jacob. He didn't want her. We're all Jacob. The Lord has given us infinite blessings, heavenly blessings for free. And we're saying we don't want him. Satan is deceiving us with worldly pleasures and we are running, chasing them, working day and night as slaves to get what Satan is given to us, nothing but deception. Leah gave Jacob blessings, gave Jacob the scribes, the writers of the Bible, gave Jacob the word of God. She gave Jacob the priesthood. She gave Jacob Christ, the savior. 
On the other hand, he was dying to marry Rachel. We're dying to enjoy life on earth, worldly, materialistic pleasures. Look at Rachel. What did she give Jacob? Nothing but a headache and a heartache for all of his life. She gave him two sons, Benjamin and Joseph. Joseph is one of the brothers whom the others tried to kill him and then they threw him in the well and sold him as a slave to those Ishmaelites merchants who took him as a slave to Egypt. Benjamin and Joseph. When Rachel was giving birth to Benjamin, she died giving birth. Jacob chasing Rachel, he lost love. He lost his love. At giving birth to Benjamin, the love of his life died and that love was lost. When she gave him Joseph, Joseph broke Jacob's heart when he went missing all these years. Dad kept on crying until he lost his eyesight. He could not see anymore out of tears and sorrows and pains, wondering what happened to the love of my heart after Rachel. See, Joseph, to our father Jacob, he smelt the fragrance of Rachel through Joseph. Joseph is missing, the heart is broken. When you chase the world, the world will make you lose your love and will give you nothing but a broken heart. This is the world, Rachel. I went out with my friends and I said, what a wonderful feeling. What a beautiful, glorious life this is. We're enjoying it to the max. We're going and coming, dancing, singing, drinking, eating, and we're up there till two, three, four o'clock in the morning, and we're not coming back home till the following day. Now this is what I call life, but you keep on doing this, you'll end up losing the love of your life, who is Christ Jesus, and you will end up being nothing but a broken heart. Everyone will disappoint you. On earth, in this world, you'll get nothing but disappointments. Broken heart. At Rachel's tomb, you will meet two men. Number two in the Holy Bible can represent lack or shortage. Numbers in the Holy Bible have meanings. Number two in one hand can represent love, but in this particular passage, number two represents lack, shortage. You see, we use it in our daily sort of dialect and conversation. You, you go to your friend and you say, you know what, I'm going on holidays for a couple of days. Don't you use that terminology? I'm going for a couple of days. Now, a couple of days, it doesn't literally mean couple, like two days. But it means I'm going on holidays, it's a short holiday. So to, to reflect what short holiday means, I reflected with a couple of days. So two represent shortage, lack, something short, something little, minute. So you're going to meet two men. Now these two give us two lessons. The first lesson is a negative one. The second lesson is a positive one. In the first lesson, which is a negative, God is saying, do not put all your hopes and dreams in this world you live in. This is the lack and the shortage thing if you do. If you put all your hope and dreams in this world, you're going to end up being short because the world will give you nothing but short and lack. The world will never give you fullness. The world will never give you richness. The world will never give you fulfillment. It will always give you shortage and lack of things. Because the world doesn't have it in order to give you. 
All of the world is vanity. And if you chase vanity, meaning emptiness, you're going to end up with emptiness. And emptiness is short, is lacking. That's the negative lesson. God says, don't put all your hopes and dreams in this world. You'll get nothing at the end. You'll end up being short of the glory of God. The second lesson is the positive one. The second lesson at the tomb of Rachel, they will say from there, go to Bethel, go to the house of God. Wow. You see, when you stand before the tomb of Rachel, the tomb of Rachel is a reminder for me and you and all of us that we are nothing but total strangers to this world. We are nothing but tourists in this world. We are nothing but travelers in this world. The world is not ours. So don't dwell on Rachel's tomb. Don't stay there all your life. You need to move on. But before you move on to the house of God, you need to remind yourself the world is a stranger, is a strange place to me. I don't belong to it. Until you confess that you are a stranger to the world, you cannot see yourself in the house of the Lord. Because the house of the Lord is for those who say, I do not belong to the world, I belong to Christ. The moment you say this to yourself, I don't belong to the world, I belong to Christ, you'll begin seeing yourself coming to church more often. Because where your treasure is, there is going to be your heart. And if Christ is your treasure, you're going to be where Christ is, not the world. So he said, from the tomb of Rachel is a reminder, you don't belong in this world. You are a departed soul, Rachel. Remember, you're not going to live here forever. You need to go to the house of God to prepare yourself for eternity. Stop wasting time in the world. When you go to the house of God, Bethel, you're going to meet three men. One carrying three young goats. The other three loaves of bread. My neighbor, can you lend me three loaves of bread? You're going to find another one carrying three loaves of bread. The other one carrying a skin of wine. And they will give you two loaves of bread. Now the one carrying the three young goats is God the Father. The one carrying the three loaves of bread is God the Son. The one carrying the skin of wine is God the Holy Spirit. The Holy Trinity is chasing us for redemption, salvation, and the new birth of the Spirit. It is the Holy Trinity that is trying to redeem us, save us, and bring us back home safe and sound. God the Father carrying the three goats. Why is God the Father carrying the three goats? Now the goat, the goat symbolizes rejection. Rejection. The Lord Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 24 says, when, when the Son of Man comes back again, He will put the sheep on His right hand and He will put the goats on His left hand. Now left hand represent death, represent rejection. The right hand represent life, acceptance. So the sheep represent acceptance, life. The goat represents rejection, death. So the goat is rejection. And, and the reason why goats represent uh, rejection, even in the Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 8, you see, the, the, the baptized soul is seeking the good shepherd. She's saying to him, where are you at mid-noon, 12 noon? I'm seeking you. I'm searching for you. I can't find you. He's, he replies and he says, if you don't know or fairest among women, go out on the footprints of the, of, the, of the sheep and bring out your goats at the shepherd's tent. Bring out your goats at the shepherd's tent, meaning when you go on the footprints of the sheep, saints, the saints will lead you to the shepherd's tent, the church. And you come to the church, you will face the altar. On the altar is the body and the blood of Christ, 
the savior of the world. When you are in front of the altar, bring out your goats, meaning confess your sins. So goat represents sin and every sin is a rejection to God. Who is carrying our rejections? The father. Why? Because it was the God, the father who loved us, thus created us brought us into existence. It was out of love that we came into existence. But this love is holy, cannot accept sin. He is holy. So therefore every sin is a rejection to the Holy Father who art in heaven. So he's carrying three goats. One goat is the body. The other goat is the soul. The other goat is your spirit. You are made out of body, soul, and spirit. First Thessalonians 5.23, St. Paul says, when we made a mistake, we made the mistake in the body with the soul, with the spirit. The three are in it together. Therefore, God the Father is carrying the goats, meaning he is trying to save us body, soul, and spirit. All of us, the perfect human, the complete human. Now, how is he going to save us, God the Father? Well, and the Son, the Son is carrying three loaves of bread, Jesus Christ. He is the Son of God. He is God himself. In the Son, salvation was made possible. And the Son is carrying three loaves of bread. Bread symbolizes life. I am the living bread that descended from heaven. He who eats me shall live in me forever. I am the bread of life. So the son is the bread and the bread represents life. For Jesus came to give us life and abundant life, i.e. eternal life that never ceases. The son is carrying three loaves of bread. Again, the three loaves, one for the body, one for the soul, one for the spirit. But Samuel says to um, Saul, they will give you two loaves of bread, not three. Wow. See, the first loaf is the birth of the spirit. Through salvation, the spirit is born only. Through salvation, the spirit is born only. The body cannot be born. The soul cannot be born. The birth is only for the spirit. Now a proof of the birth of the spirit, I'll give you two proofs, one internal, the other external. The internal proof that we became born again spiritually is you find that in Romans chapter eight, verse 16, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. We were born again to be children of God through the sacrament of the holy baptism. The spirit is born again through the sacrament of the holy baptism. When we receive the Holy Spirit through the holy baptism, that spirit, the Holy Spirit is, is now bearing witness with our spirit that we are now children of God. And the external proof, the Lord said to his disciples, every time you pray, you say, our Father. Since we became the children of God in Romans 8.16, then God is our daddy. In Matthew 6.9 and Luke 11.3, every time you pray, you say, our Father. We became children through, through baptism. God is my dad. Without the Holy Spirit in me, I can never call God daddy. That's why do not be shocked when people say, how dare you, you call God dad. That's a blasphemy. You see, they don't have the Holy Spirit. The moment they receive the Holy Spirit through baptism, they will cry out to God, daddy, daddy always. The second loaf, salvation of the soul. Salvation of the soul. 
First Corinthians 1.18. Look at this. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Who are being saved now. Who are being saved in the present tense. While we live on earth, we are being saved. It is the power of God. To those non-believers, the cross is foolishness. But to us, it is the power of God because we, we are being saved through the cross. The shedding of the blood of the Lamb of God saved the soul. Baptism gave birth, second birth to the spirit. The blood saves the soul. What is this? Time flies, man. Have I been talking for an hour? Oh my goodness. Can't believe this. I wish I had time more to elaborate why the soul needs to be saved or why salvation is for the soul, not for the body, not for the spirit. Maybe another time. I'll have to sum it up. The third loaf. Redemption of the body. Romans 8.23 Eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. St. Paul is saying it. So the redemption is for the body. Romans 8.23 Eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. Meaning, your body will be changed into an illuminative body. A spiritual body, a glorified body, which the Lord Jesus rose with on Sunday resurrection. He, he came out of the tomb with the glorified body. It is a three-dimensional body, but spiritual, illuminative. It is whiter than snow, perfect to enter the perfect place where God is. The perfect God is. That is why... He was given two loaves of bread, not three. Why? Since the bread is talking about the redemption of the body, therefore the body has not been fully redeemed yet. When will it be fully redeemed? In the second coming of the Messiah, when he will give us the glorified body. Do we have the glorified body now? No. That's why the old Adam is still living in us once we came out of baptism. You see, I'll have to say this. When the Lord God sent Moses to Egypt to Pharaoh and said, tell Pharaoh to release my people, otherwise I will strike you and the, and the nation of Egypt. So anyway, they come out. When they came out of Egypt to actually depart from Egypt fully, they had to cross, number one, the Red Sea. When they crossed the Red Sea, they came across the, um, uh, the Sinai Desert. They lived and moved in circle for 40 years. The moment they crossed the River Jordan, they entered into the Promised Land. You see, once you leave Egypt and cross the Red Sea, you don't enter the Promised Land immediately. Why? Because Egypt represents the world and the prince of the world is Pharaoh representing Satan. Satan is ruling the world. You want to come out of the slavery and the bondage of Pharaoh, Satan. You want to leave the pleasures and the treasures of the world, Egypt. You must cross the Red Sea. What is the Red Sea? Baptism. You read in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 to 14. He will say to you, St. Paul, that those who crossed that Red Sea, they were baptized unto Moses. So there was a symbolic baptism to the true baptism, which the true Moses Christ is going to give us in the end of times when he came. So crossing the Red Sea is holy baptism. And with holy baptism, I left the world, Egypt, and I came out of the slavery of Satan, Pharaoh, under the rulership of the King of Kings, Jesus Christ, 
the king over the kingdom of heaven. But when I came out of baptism, I didn't go straight away to the promised land. I came to the wilderness of Sinai. The wilderness of Sinai is my life on earth for as long as it may be. One day, 100 years, 50, whatever time frame God has given me to live on earth, that is the desert of Sinai. When the day comes that, I, that the spirit departs from this body, that is the day when I cross the river Jordan. And the word Jordan means death. The moment I die physically, the spirit comes out of this body, I cross the river Jordan. When I cross it, I enter the promised land. When the spirit leaves the body, you enter, not Jerusalem straight away, the Palestine border. You enter paradise, the transit. When I go to paradise, I still, my body hasn't been redeemed fully yet. Why? Because they gave me two loaves of bread, not three. The third one is to do with the body. See, the first coming of the Messiah, he gave birth to my spirit through baptism. And he gave salvation to my soul by shedding his blood on the cross. But to redeem my body, it's going to happen in the second coming of the Messiah when he gives me the glorified body which he rose with and went to heaven and sat at the right hand of the Father. That glorified body, then my body is redeemed once and for all. That's why he gave me two loaves of bread. He kept the third one for the second coming for the redemption of the body. Now, who is going to fulfill all this work? God the Father carried all my rejections, God, sins, body, soul, and spirit. Meaning he is here to save me out of uh, with all of them, body, soul, and spirit. Salvation was made possible in the Son by giving me two loaves out of the three loaves. He gave birth to my spirit baptism. He gave salvation to my soul by uh, uh, pouring his, his blood on Calvary. And on the second coming, he will redeem my body with the glorified body. Now, how is all of this going to come together? By the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was carrying a skin of wine. Wine symbolizes the Holy Spirit. In the book of Acts chapter 2 verse 13, others mocking said they are full of new wine. You know when the Holy Spirit descended on Pentecost, they came out speaking in different languages. They said, hey, these guys are Jews. One guy is speaking Arabic, the other one is Chinese. What's going on? Are they drunk with new kind of a wine that we've never come across with before? No. Yes, they were drunk, but not with an earthly wine. It was a new wine. And the new wine is in Ephesians 5.18. And do not be drunk with wine in which is dis, uh, dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. The new wine being filled by the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit dwells in us, when the Holy Spirit engulfs us, we will be walking in a new wine, speaking a new language. It's not about speaking in tongues, and I will do a special lecture about speaking in tongues because this is nothing but a fake heresy of the end of times. The garabara waramara is, is, is nothing but mumbo jumbo. Nothing to do with the Holy Spirit, nothing to do with the Lord Jesus, nothing to do with speaking in tongues, my beloved. We will be filled with a new wine, the Holy Spirit. I'll have to finish it. Can you lend me three loaves of bread? Said to his neighbor. He said, you want to know what the loaves of bread are? Read 1 Samuel chapter 10. When you go to Rachel's tomb, 
you'll find two men. They'll say, whatever you've lost, nothing is lost. Why are you worried? I wasted my time being an alcoholic. I wasted my time being a drug addict. I wasted my time living in the pleasures of this world. It's too late. Nothing is lost. For as long as Jesus lives, you live, my dear friend. Jesus can recompensate every loss before you blink your eyes. Don't ever lose hope. Don't ever say it's too late. Don't ever say it's beyond repair. Nothing stands in the Lord's way. Nothing. Just come back to Him. He'll do it. Before you open your mouth, He'll do it. So when you stand before the tomb of Rachel, it is a reminder I'm a stranger to this world. I am a departed soul. Stop chasing the pleasures of the world. When you say I'm a stranger to the world, God will turn your face to Bethel, the house of God. You'll come to Jesus, my dear friend, to daddy's home. When you come to daddy's home, they will give you two loaves of bread. They will save you in body, in soul, and in spirit. But the redemption of the body, that bread will be left for the second coming of the Messiah, where Jesus will give you the glorified body. Hallelujah. He will bring you to his father's house, into his chamber. And he'll say, this is my bride, daddy. The one you gave me, I made her perfect. Like us. Nothing is worth it in this world. Stop chasing what is not yours. You know, we can have a lot of fun in this life with the Lord. I can still go downtown with the Lord. But this time will be different because I'll be preaching to the world. I will not be conformed, but rather transformed. Because God renewed my mind. I'm a new being now. Jesus gave me the second birth for my spirit. Jesus gave me salvation to my soul. And Jesus will give me redemption for my body by giving me his glorified body. The resurrected Messiah. He'll dress me up with him. And I'll leave you with this. St. John the Beloved in his epistle says... We don't know what we will encounter in the second life. But one thing I can say with certainty. We will all be Christ-like. We will all be Christ-like. I don't know what I'm going to encounter. What kind of glories are awaiting me in the, in the second life in my father's chamber. But I know one thing. I'll be like G. I'll, I'll be like Christ. What do you mean you'll be like Christ? He says, yes, because he will dress me up in him. His glorified body will give me in the second coming. I'll be like him, but with a difference. All of us will have the glorified body, but Christ's glorified body will always carry the wounds of the cross forever. When we see him, the only thing that is going to differentiate that body with our body are the wounds. He will keep them on his glorified body forever and ever and ever to remind all of us what love is all about. Maybe someone might die for a friend, but no one dies for a sinner. Jesus did it. He died for a sinner like me. Now son, these wounds are the reminder for you how much I love you.